Hello, my name is Dr. Robert Ainsworth and this is Mr. Buck and we want to welcome you to your appointed journey. I have a copy of our book with us today, The Feast, Your Appointed Journey. And um, I wanted to talk to you about the Feast of Pentecost. And the Feast of Pentecost is the fourth feast in the seasonal feast pattern that uh, the, it, we have three seasons. So there's the first season, which is in the early spring, and then the second season, which is either late spring, or early summer, depending on the year. And then we have the third season, which is in the fall. Now, the second season has one feast, just one, and that is the Feast of Pentecost. The first and third seasons each have three feasts in them. So there are a total of seven feasts. Now, as we look at the various feasts and the various seasons, we discover that we have, we have uh, patterns and processes that we live by and that God uh, uses the feast to teach us how to grow in our relationship with him. Now, let me tell you, I'm not saying that you as a Christian should practice or observe the feast. What I am saying to you is that you should learn from the feast. Paul wrote in, for, in 2 Corinthians that these things, the feast of the Lord, the Old Testament as a whole, these things are given to us for our instruction, for our edification, for our ed education. And so we should learn lessons from these things. We don't practice or observe the Sabbath, but we learn that the Sabbath teaches us about rest and that Jesus Christ is the Sabbath, meaning he is the one that we rest in. And so the Feast of Passover, we say in our book and in our discipleship model, our discipleship pattern, that, the feast, that there are adjective noun pairs. And these adjective noun pairs help to describe. So Passover, as an example, is about victory. But not just any victory. It's about the all-encompassing victory because Jesus won it all. He secured it all as the Paschal Lamb. He took care of all sin, all sickness, all disease, all bondages. He took care of it all. So in the same way, just like Passover has the all-encompassing victory, so also does Pentecost have an adjective noun pair. We have supernatural, that's our adjective, obedience, and supernatural power. Supernatural obedience, God calls us to obey him. But you cannot obey him in your own strength and in your own power. We are not capable of doing that. And so we need supernatural power, supernatural obedience. We need the power and the might of God working in our lives in order for us to live for him. And so Pentecost in the discipleship uh, pattern is about supernatural obedience. Now, I want to zero in on the obedience for just a moment. Because Christians today, and I'm talking about the, in the Protestant, Pentecostal, charismatic movements, they don't like the idea of obedience. They want to be free. When, when I say obedience, many people think of law, rules, regulations. Jesus said in the Gospel of John that if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. So a measure or a proof of love is obedience. Parents, you know that your children treasure you and value you and, and love you when they obey you. In fact, when they disobey you, you don't feel loved. You feel disrespected. You don't feel honored. 
And in the same way, God expects you to love him. And the proof of the depth of your love is the extent of your obedience. But then you might say to me, well, what do you mean by obedience? What does it mean to obey? Well, obedience is... is following along with the Lord's standards. Obedience is doing things that God wants you to do, even if he doesn't tell you to do it. That's real obedience. But Jesus defined obedience. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. That's the greatest commandment. Obey that. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm struck with the depth, uh, the, 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 the sheer content of the vitriolic language in our society today. I am dismayed, if you will, at how angry people are, how mean-spirited they are when they communicate. In Proverbs, the wisest guy, the smartest guy, the most brilliant guy in all of mankind, Solomon. He wrote six things the Lord hates, seven he detests. Six he hates, seven, the seventh he detests. And what was that last one, that one that went over the edge. It went just a step too far. What was it? Those who divide the brethren. Those who separate brothers. Those who divide brothers. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the third season, is about joyful fellowship. And that division, that seventh item, is a violation, a breaking of fellowship. There are Christians. Maybe I'm being a little too generous. If you don't love your brother or your sister, then how can you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. He's the one that the scriptures describe, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so the measure of love was to give of yourself, even if it hurts, to give of yourself so that others might benefit. We're not asking you to go to the cross. But I am demanding that you stop hating, that you stop hurting, that you stop dividing, Hello? Stop. Stop. Start loving. Mr. Buck obeys because he would rather be with me than away from me. I obey God because I'd rather be with him than away from him. How about you? Have you been involved in the disobedience realm? You know what I mean. Using the blade of your tongue to cut and to slash and to stab your brother and your sister? 
Have you been launching flaming arrows of hateful words and divisive speech to others? Guard your soul. Guard your heart. You get involved in that and it'll set your own heart on fire. Be warned, my friend. Don't be engaged in divisive speech. Preach love. Preach mercy and grace. Obey the Lord. Obey Him. Love Him with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you. God bless you.